what I'm planning to do in the next half hour is just uh, take you through a little bit of a guided tour of uh, your, the, the, the host country, Canada, income inequality, and what it looks like from multiple standpoints. Uh, so the thing about income inequality in Canada um, is that it's, it's, getting, it's getting worse. Um, so Canada is a very wealthy country because of our natural resources. When you look around, you can imagine um, we rank among the top 10 countries in terms of quality of life. On many measures, uh, things look very good. Uh, certainly since the Second World War, Canadians have advanced the social promise that, um, that the next generation will do as well or better uh, than the previous generation. And I was born into that Canada. I was born in 1965 in Canada and uh, benefited from a social bargain um, where uh, the mass of citizens through taxation, um, through uh, taking the gains from economic growth and shared prosperity, how they poured it, it pulled it back into um, public programs through governments, through taxation, that sort of thing. And as a result of that, uh, uh, had access to some of the best education, public education in the world, um, some of the best health care in the world. Uh, and, um, and over the course of my lifetime, just since 1965, things have been changing quite uh, dramatically in Canada. So income inequality is getting worse. Uh, the distance between the rich and the rest of us has been growing. Um, and the, ch the trend for income inequality in Canada has changed. It used to be that income inequality would grow during recessionary periods because people would lose their jobs, and so they'd fall down to the bottom of the income spectrum, and then the economy would recover, uh, and they'd get jobs again, and then the gap would narrow. Uh, but that trend has shifted. Now the gap keeps growing. It's on a one-way trend up. Uh, so I'm going to share with you different snapshots of what that looks like. Um, just by way of background, I'm a sociologist who works with economists, a uh, team of economists from across the, the country, um, trying to describe the problem of income inequality in Canada. And, um, and we do peer-researched research, uh, a peer-reviewed peer research, um, but we also have a, a mandate to make it, um, a, a, to communicate it in a way that the that you know you could go on talk radio and, talk, and people could relate to it, so you'll see a little bit of that as well. So here's a slide that I don't often get to include in my public talks um, because it's a Gini coefficient, and we often don't talk about Gini coefficients. Most people um, aren't very well schooled in this. Um, the Gini coefficient. Uh, this is uh, a slide from Lars Osberg from Dalhousie University in Halifax. Um, and he did a comparison over time of Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And this is a comparison that isn't often made, but, you know, North America does include Mexico. And so what you can see here um, through this uh, chart is that, the, that while income inequality is higher in Mexico, um, you see that income inequality has been going down in Mexico since the 1990s, whereas it's been going up in the U.S. and in Canada. And you can see the red line um, representing Canada that we're, we're doing better in terms of income inequality than the US is. But you can also see we're starting to just track, sort of mirror some of, of that trend of what's going on in the US. Um, and this is my second and last Gini coefficient snapshot for you. Uh, and this one is courtesy of our uh, resident economist, Armin Yelmazian, who is one of Canada's foremost experts in, on income inequality. Uh, and this shows how income inequality has been rising in Canada since 1990. It shows the trajectory um, over uh, a, a generation. And it gives you a little bit of a sense of where we sit on the scale compared to some other countries as well. Uh, so now let's break this down. Uh, we like to talk about market income, uh, to take a look at what's happening um, in, with market income because it tells you a little bit of something about what's happening in the labor market and how the labor market is um, valuing workers along the income spectrum. And so we're going to look at the richest 1%. This is over uh, a period of time, over about a generation, 1980 to 2009. 
And you see the blue line represents the richest 20%, uh, and their income over this period uh, increased by about 38%. And the red line um, on this side is uh, the poorest 20%, their income dropped by 11.4%. And then see that little sliver in the middle? I know, it's kind of hard to let, take a look at that. That's what's going on in the middle, uh, the very middle uh, in Canada in terms of market income uh, over that time period. So uh, in Canada, we are starting to have the conversation. It's a very recent conversation in terms of uh, a public discussion. When, when we founded the Income Inequality Research Project in 2006, it was barely talked about. Uh, in fact, we had trouble getting journalists to write stories about it. Um, and when we would write stories about CEO pay, we would actually have uh, some, some uh, news outlets write editorials about how it's no one's business what CEOs get paid and why are we doing this kind of research. So a lot has changed just over the course of uh, the last few years. Um, but we're starting to talk about how the middle, uh, middle class in Canada is starting to, uh, to fade, is shrinking. And so this is what we're talking about, what's going on in the labor market. Uh, so this is just a, a picture of just giving you a sense of what's been changing over time in terms of the richest 1%. Um, so the richest 1% in Canada in the 1950s and 60s took about 8% of income growth share in Canada. Uh, and that changed dramatically. Uh, between 1997 and 2007, the richest 1% took 32% of the share. So the economy has been growing, but the gains of economic growth have been going more and more into the hands of a concentrated few at the top. There are, there's new Statistics Canada data that just came out uh, in the last month um, that looks at what the gap between the richest 1% and then the, not, the bottom 90% of Canadians. Um, and that data shows that the two worst provinces in Canada for the gap between the 1% and the rest of us are Alberta, um, which is oil blessed, um, and Ontario, the province that I live in right now. Yeah, oil cursed, yeah, exactly. Uh, two words for you tar sands. <laughs> Um, so, uh, taking a look at what happened in, um, just to give you a, an example of in Ontario, uh, and Ontario is where um, a lot of the financial sector is based, on Bay Street in downtown Toronto. Uh, and so, in Ontario, over the course of uh, a, about a 30 year period, incomes of the richest 1% grew by 71%. So what happened to the incomes of the bottom 90%? their income grew by 5%. So uh, every way we keep looking at it, the story of income inequality in Canada and why the trend is changing, it's being driven by what's happen happening at the very top of the income scale. Uh, and this is just a, a little snapshot of it by cities in, in Canada because uh, income inequality, it differs by province and it differs by city. Uh, so Calgary, which is sort of the oil capital of Canada, um, you see that the gap between the richest 1% uh, and the 90% is, uh, is greatest there. And then Toronto comes in second and Vancouver, this beautiful city, comes in third. Um, and so uh, Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, Montreal, these are the four cities where um, the majority of the richest 1% uh, live and work. Uh, we had political economist uh, Jordan Brennan do some research for us. He's documented the correlation between um, rising income inequality in Canada, especially the rise of the richest 1%, and um, the concentration of corporate power in Canada as well. And so he looked at the top 60 firms. In the 1950s, their share of income in Canada was 2%. And by 2006, their share um, had almost tripled. So, um, so he, we're starting to document new correlations about what the relationships are um, at play behind this phenomenon. Uh, and so wealth is also highly concentrated in Canada. Uh, our, our national um, research body, statistical body, Stats Can St Statistics Canada, um, doesn't regularly report wealth data. Uh, it, 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 we, we wait for years and years to get it. Apparently there's supposed to be an, a, a new survey 
uh, that will come out at the end of this year or next year, but uh, 2005 is the last time we ever heard anything officially on that front. Um, so I just pulled a sample thing from Forbes magazine, 25 uh, Canadian families or individuals um, uh, are, uh, uh, hold more than $1 billion in assets in Canada, according to For Forbes magazine. Um, and then the flip side of this is what's happening to the majority of households in Canada. And, you know, because of those flatlining incomes uh, in the middle, what we're seeing is that household savings rates are, are going down um, and that Canadians are carrying record high household debt, um, so much so that uh, the Bank of Canada Governor Mark Carney has repeatedly warned that this is our, our hidden problem, our, our, our big, our hidden bubble out there and that we uh, neglect it at our peril. So uh, average incomes have flatlined um, and there are a few things informing that. There's, there are less secure jobs than there were even 20 years ago. There are fewer, fewer union jobs, although our unionization rates are still high, uh, higher than they are in the U.S., we are starting to uh, see a decline in that, um, and we see the rise of precarious work uh, in Canada. Um, and, uh, and that's speeding up, especially since the 2008 recession. So here's another picture for you. Um, uh, considering the precarious nature of Canada's middle class, this, this picture to me is, is troubling. Um, we wanted to map out the arc of inequality in, in its relationship with the unionization rate over time. Um, so this is from the 1940s to 2007. And so you saw that the richest 10%, um, you see they represent the red line, and then the unionization rate represents uh, the green line. So you see this interesting convergence um, in the, and then after the 1990s, a, a new trend. You see the richest 10% uh, gaining in terms of income and you see a, a decline in the unionization rate. Of course, income inequality uh, has a face. It's experienced differently by different people depending on where you live. Uh, depending on whether you're a woman, um, whether you're a, a racialized Canadian, whether you live with a disability, um, and whether you are a First Nations person. So in Canada, um, women's, women still make only 68 cents per every man's dollar. So we still have a, a, a fairly significant gender pay gap, even though the vast majority of women and even the vast majority of women with children uh, under the age of 12 are, are working in the workforce. Uh, and, um, and so the gap is worse for racialized Canadians, it's worse for immigrants, it's worse for first generation immigrants, it's, for, it's worse for second generation immigrants, um, and for First Nations people. So we had our economist David McDonald team up with an uh, Aboriginal uh, research analyst, Dan Wilson, to look at First Nations income inequality in Canada. Um, and the, the gap is so big in Canada that they said at this rate, unless, unless we do something radically different, um, it wouldn't disappear for 63 years. And that would just be for First Nations to catch up with um, you know, the, the way things are right now. So uh, clearly all signs point to different strategies need to be in place. And I just wanted to give you a sense of what First Nations income inequality looks like in Canada because you know, we're on this beautiful, lush campus, and we and we drove by multi-million dollar homes. You know, some of the richest five percent live in this area. Um, on in many uh, Aboriginal reserves in Canada, they live in shacks, and this is what the water looks like. There's boil. That's not lemonade. That's water. There's boil. Uh, uh, boil water orders across reservations across Canada in, you know, we're one of the top 10 or 12 wealthiest nations on the planet. Um, so what, what we really do have here is an underlying ongoing problem reflecting um, the, the ongoing impacts of colonialism. So, um, you know, income inequality is also about where you live and, and the quality of life. And, um, and it looks different by neighborhoods. So this is a picture of 
uh, of one of the poorest downtown neighborhoods in Toronto, um, Regent Park. It's one of Canada's poorest neighborhoods. And so you see there are a lot of skyscrapers, a lot of, they live in a lot of tall, old residential skyscraper buildings. And apartment buildings and there are a lot of thoroughfares highways sort of leading in out of it and not a lot of greenery and just to show you by comparison let's go to one of Canada's wealthier uh, communities this is Oakville in Ontario on the lake look at all the nice swimming pools in the backyards and greenery and then in Toronto this is a gated community the bridal path and notice how fewer roads go into it essentially they created roads for you to get to your house and back but not for outsiders to come through it's it's a, a very protected place but lots of greenery um, the requisite back backyard pools so we have different experiences of income inequality in canada and um, uh, of course, we know from uh, the international literature, and, and last night we talked about Wilson and Pickett, Wilkinson and Pickett, and how uh, they talk about in societies that tolerate high levels of income inequality, you have less hope, less trust in your institutions, more crime, uh, social unrest, and worth, worse health outcomes. And we're starting to see elements of that in Canada. Um, it's not, it hasn't reached an extreme yet. But certainly public polling shows that uh, the majority of Canadians uh, are now having a very bleak, um, a bleak vision of the future. So ECOS polling asked Canadians um, whether they thought their kids and grandkids would do as well or better than the last generation or the next generation. Um, and for the first time in um, Frank Graves, the president of ECOS polling, in his first time in his 30 year career, he said, that the vast majority of Canadians said, no, I don't think the next generation is going to do as well or better. So he's seeing a change in terms of what the hopes are out there. Um, and he also said that um, for the first time in his career, uh, Canadians named income inequality as the major concern for them that they'd like to see happen. So I hear a lot about this. In, in Canada, you get this, well, all we need is like more Steve Jobs. Um, and, you know, I, I love my Apple products. You guys should check these out because they're pretty good. But, um, but this is what happens when you build a society based on the hypervaluation of some workers and not all, um, and not equal valuation, the hypervaluation of CEOs. And so um, every year we look at the highest paid 100 CEOs in Canada and we compare them to average income for Canadians. And so uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so this is in 1998. The highest paid 100 CEOs in Canada made 105 times more than the average income in Canada. By 2010, that had grown to 169 times more. So in a very short time frame. And so this is, these are, this is part of one dimension of Canada's richest 1%. And just for comparative, per that's the average income. That's just to compare, uh, and it's hard to see, so let's look. Average income in Canada is 45000 and change. So we see this inc increasing gap as we have some workers, CEOs, hypervaluated, rewarded um, with stock options, bonuses, gold-plated pensions, uh, and, um, and at the same time, they're driving a conversation in Canada um, where, where you have CEOs, you have the business class, you have the political class saying no one deserves a job for life. You know, you, we need to be flexible. So this is what's going on. It's a cult of the CEO. Um, and uh, that we're, we've got that um, versus the devaluation, uh, ongoing devaluation of most workers and uh, a heightened uh, rhetoric in Canada that's very anti-union. Uh, we're, we're seeing a number of provincial governments now talking about looking at the right to work laws in the US and the right to work laws really just are a way of weakening uh, the labor movement and um, and so this is uh, and this rhetoric has really been stepped up since the 2008 recession um, so what you have are um, is the political class using um, austerity cuts, that sort of thing, in the name of deficit reduction, 
to expedite the neoliberal uh, agenda here. So um, what's, what's happening here is we're undoing a lot of the gains that previous generations in Canada uh, had made for us, and we're undoing a social bargain um, that had been uh, implicitly agreed upon post-war. And, um, you know, for a while there, it wasn't perfect, but Canada looked like it was beginning to look like it was going to be a pretty grand experiment. Um, and we went from high levels of income inequality in the 1920s, mass levels of poverty in the 1930s, um, to the creation and growth of the middle class, to kids like me, I grew up in a, in a poor family on a farm, uh, and, you know, get to, got to ha experience income mobility, um, got to experience the best uh, higher education, and it was affordable, and I didn't have to, you know, go into massive debt at the time. Uh, kids today have to. Uh, so a lot of things are changing uh, in Canada, and a lot of the progress that, that my generation benefited from, uh, I think a lot of those gains are being unraveled, and I'm not so sure that young Canadians uh, coming behind me will be able to say that they experienced a lot of the same benefits that I did in my lifetime. But I'm out here trying. So, thank you. Thank you.